Hello, welcome to the Ocean of Sound Summit in our interview slash presentation with Dr. Ibrahim Kareem. Full disclosure, we were not able to connect live with Dr. Ibrahim Kareem prior to our summit, so we are bringing you the next best thing. We're going to play a video from his YouTube channel introducing his work on biogeometry, and we're going to offer our commentary on it. Now, we are in touch with his office, and we hope to be bringing you a live presentation in the near future, a live interview in the near future. So do stay tuned with us. Hang with us on this, and we'll get it to you. Now, for this interview, I'm sorry, this presentation, this video, he divides it into three parts. So we're going to divide our commentary into three parts as well. And today we're bringing you parts one and two. And hopefully if we have time to get back together before the summit, we'll bring you part three for the summit. If not, again, stay tuned to us. We will get that to you. It's amazing work. I am so grateful for uh, Amani for bringing this to us. I'm gonna let her introduce him. She is more well-versed in his work than I am. I'm absolutely grateful for her to, to her for bringing this to our summit because it is so relevant to the topic and it brings so many pieces together. So I do hope you'll enjoy this. Stay tuned for parts one and two, and we'll catch you soon for part three. Take it away, Amani. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, yeah, I has I have been attracted to sacred geometry. So when I found Dr. Uh, Karim speaking about biological geometry, it was a very fascinating new topic, uh, very thought provoking, and I think there is truth to it. So uh, I invite everybody to uh, listen to more of his uh, YouTubes. But here is um, a short biography of Dr. Karim, born in Egypt in 1942. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Karim is a graduate in, in architecture engineering from the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland, with a PhD in technology in tourist planning. He is an architectural engineer by profession a hospital design consultant and a tourist planner. He is also practicing interior uh, architecture sorry, and furniture and product design with a new environmental worldwide. Dr. Karim is the founder of Biogeometry, the science of subtle energy quality in a new paradigm in architecture and industrial design that uses the subtle energy effect of geometrical shapes to restore harmony to our modern technology environments. And he teaches in several countries such as Egypt, Canada, Switzerland, and USA. So I hope you will enjoy the YouTube. We might pause it in the middle to share some commentaries or insight and also uh, at the end we'll share our reflections on it hello everybody this lecture is going to be about biogeometry design because as you know biogeometry is anchored in design and i'm an architect so it's a core uh, topic in biogeometry so I'm going to divide this talk in three uh, sort of three parts. First, I'll discuss concepts. Then a bit of history, and then we will go into uh, practical uh, methods and disciplines and all that. So it will be three parts. The problem with uh, a design lecture that is equally uh, for people who do not know anything about biogeometry as well as for advanced biogeometry students is somehow to put information on those two levels plus 
squeezing a subject that would need a couple of weeks at least, squeezing it into an hour. So you see the problem I have in front of me. But in an introductory lecture, we need to do that. We need to give things as simple and as short as possible. So I will to try to do that with you now. Now, first of all, uh, biogeometry is all about design related to life force and consciousness because geometry is geo is the earth metri has to do with measurements of the earth that means land survey basically as it was in ancient egypt and when you put geo with bio you're moving to another dimension you are you're moving from the physical to the subtle energy level so bio geometry means measuring the life force of the earth bio here is a life force and it includes uh, consciousness of course and that makes the earth a living being a living being and in which we are part we do not live on the earth we live in the earth because we live inside the atmosphere of the earth which is part of the earth itself so we are part of this living being just as our immune cells or blood cells are part of our being so when we act, we have to act according to the general uh, laws of the being in which we are part. So we will start from there looking at the language of nature. Now, imagine if you lived in a country that spoke a language and you did not speak the language of that country. You would be pretty useless because you wouldn't be able to communicate with others. Now, we live in nature and there's a divine pen that keeps writing and drawing all those shapes in nature. It's a message, a subtle energy message subtle energy information being constantly drawn in front of us and unfortunately nobody reads we cannot read the only language we understand is the language between us and other humans but that while useful in a certain way it's useless when it comes to the multidimensionality of life because we are not part of nature and if we are not part of nature then sooner or later we will do harm to nature nature needs to be understood and it is understood through the principles of its design language so let us go further into the design language of nature and see uh, what is different in this design language from other design languages that we use. Now, nature uh, is sort of evolving. There is continuous evolution of shapes in nature. There is life, shapes breathe, and, and they have a beginning they grow and all that and they decay so there's a form of life it's a, a continuous uh, evolution of shape in nature now we can say that uh, our cities are also in continuous evolution yes a city or a home or anything 
uh, has life inside it because we are humans. So any shape that contains life in it is living in one way or the other. So in a city, we start, it starts small as a small community, then it grows, it grows, it grows. So it is like if you take it in time lapse photography, it will be like an organism that is growing, growing into the environment. Now, well, the quality of this growth is a second uh, thing, but let's look at the fact that it is growing, growing. At certain size, it starts decaying, decaying. So every city has a life. You can call it an organism in a way, but is that nature's way? No, it is a way of growth, but it's a disease type of growth. It's not uh, uh, growing according to the laws of nature. Now, a city that grows in the laws of nature will have uh, a sort of certain energy quality, like, for example, when animals build their nests or, uh, or something like a bird that builds a nest, the nest will replenish the life force of the bird. So it acts as a sort of uh, a harmonizing second uh, body to the bird itself. And so it is in nature. So we have two aspects here. A, a living city or living homes or living communities where the homes themselves replenish the life force of those inhabitants in it. And the other side, we have human-made communities that also grow, but they sort of dissipate the life force. They take the life force out of the community in there. So one is positively charging, the other is negatively depleting. So there is something wrong in the way we are going about building our civilization, our cities and all that. We are depleting ourselves of life force. Now, comes extra things like our information technology based on electromagnetic radiation, uh, radiation in the air, waves move like that. When waves move, they create heat. Heat creates a sort of dryness. So, our systems on Earth, living systems on Earth, due to global warming, to which electromagnetic radiation is contributing. So this continuous warming of, of living systems on Earth means a reduction of water content. That's why we always need to drink water, and we can drink a lot of water, but our cells are not really uh, profiting from that water because I'm not drinking water just to have a physical water content. That's not the aim of having water. The water content in my body, the aim of it, it's a carrier of life force, carrier of living consciousness. So the whole idea here is having a lot of water with reduced life force is pretty useless. We need water that has life force, that replenishes, because positive life force is uh, a way of helping growth. You need to have positive energy, you need to have positive life force to grow. And this is where we have to look 
at the design language of nature, try to understand it. In nature, we have to see how things grow, how life force interacts with natural shapes. The moment we mention life force as a major component in the development and growth of natural shapes, uh, we enter into multidimensionality of nature's design language. It's not a design language that acts in the physical world. No, it's a design language that is multidimensional. So, for example, if I want uh, to contain uh, a liquid, I design my cup in a way that contains uh, this liquid. If it's a flat surface, it won't contain it. So it has to be designed in a certain way to contain it. Okay, that's containing physical uh, matter. Now, we want to contain the full life force. The full life force in nature has so many levels. It has vitality levels, it has emotional levels, it has mental levels, and all levels are different levels of consciousness at the same time. And there are all the laws of nature are working through all those levels. So here we are dealing with a physical shape that contains multidimensionality of subtle energy levels. That means the physical shape is only a very small part of the total living shape in nature. Now, how can it contain, how can a physical shape contain things that are elusive to it? The only way that it can do it is through resonance. And resonance, we should understand that in, uh, with a musical instrument, string instrument, for example, if you hit one uh, string, every eighth string or every string with double or half its length will resonate with it. So the law of resonance goes from zero to infinity. The law of resonance, when things are in resonance, there is a sort of uh, bidirectional information exchange. And this information is uh, how this energy affects us, meaning that it's qualitative. So qualities, as we know, for example, musical notes are an effect on us, they are qualities, sounds are qualities. And we know that they, are, they repeat themselves on, on the different octaves. So that means a quality actually exists in all levels of nature from zero to infinity. Qualities are different than quantities. Quantitative aspects are limited to certain ranges, while qualitative uh, aspects are universal. Any quality in the universe is multidimensional. So here, the shape itself on a physical level is designed in such a way that every angle in that shape resonates with a certain level of subtle energy that's invisible. So certain uh, principles, design principles that we are going to look at in the design of shape will make this shape resonate with emotions, with mental levels, with spiritual levels or with vitality. And we have those shapes, those geometrical shapes that resonate with all those levels. We can use them in biogeometry to access information on all those levels, either to find disturbances on the different levels or to correct them, the services on the uh, different levels. So we have our uh, sort of shape codes for the different subplanes of nature, and we have rulers on which we can uh, detect uh, everything on the subplanes of nature. That is why when we are studying the multidimensionality of nature's design language, we actually have the practical tools of doing the research. Now, how 
does something physical connect to the higher dimensions? Now, the resonance is achieved. The resonance with higher dimensions is achieved. The connection happens through vortices. So, you have a vortex like that that connects between every dimension. So, if I draw uh, here, if I draw, if this is one dimension, physical dimension, and then I have a vortex like this, this vortex can connect to another dimension. And you can have a, a third dimension and so on. So those vortices, they're bidirectional uh, spirals. They connect between planes of nature. So while this one is our visible one, visible plane of nature, these are invisible planes of nature, the higher planes of nature. They're invisible. So every natural shape here, imagine this thick line to be a natural shape in nature, has this multidimensional connectivity all the way to a, an archetypal level here an archetypal level. The archetypal level is a level where the patterns or the templates of all shapes are stored. And so the templates, the energy templates come down here and govern the shaping of this shape here in whatever sh shape it is governed by the shapes we call that the archetypal dimension you have the human template you have the plant template you have the tree templates and all those are communicated down here they are communicated through emotional levels mental levels and so on all those levels are consciousness levels they they come down here so there is growth but there's one thing we should understand we spoke about water. The water content here that we see here is only the physical water. But actually, water has all those higher dimensions in water that connect all the way up to the beginning of creation where we have what we call the primordial sea, the primordial fog. So this water is multidimensional. So when we speak about primordial water, it exists within normal water. Water that is connected will have all those levels of consciousness of life force. That's why life force is contained in water, because it is actually, you see physical water, but there are so many higher levels within it that contain this life force. Of course, your tap water has a break somewhere here and will not go beyond that, so it will be sort of dead water. It has to be reconnected to, be, uh, uh, to, to have the full life force. So the water in our body has the full life force. It cannot be completely cut of the life force, but what can happen is through uh, many effects on the physical level, the water can sort of become depleted. The connection with the higher levels can become clogged in some areas, can become weaker in some areas. So that means that the biogeometry design language has to find a way of generating natural shapes that include vortices coming from higher dimensions. And that's how natural ships are. They are completely interconnected between dimensions. Now, this interconnectivity brings life force here in water. Now, let us imagine what happens when I have uh, something here that has no water content. So, let's say I have a, a rock or I have a seed, or I have a, a, anything, and it has no water content. That means 
that it has no life force, which is not really true, because it might not have this water content on that level, but everything in nature, even if it's inanimate, like rocks and things like that, they have all the other levels. And then, when the, this level, the water, physical water level is given, is given there, is given to it, they connect to the higher levels. When it's given to a seed, it connects to higher levels. When it's given to, to earth, earth starts uh, showing the energy of life in its clay and so on. So, this gives you the concept of the natural design language that has to primarily deal with a sort of creating vortices that connect to higher dimension. Uh, there's a form of uh, multidimensional or three-dimensional rotation involved uh, in there. So, uh, if we look at natural shapes, we will find that every natural shape has those centers. So, even a human being, let us look at a human being. I, I get my friend here, this is a statue, and we've dealt with this in our courses. Now, I can actually measure centers of rotation on the statue. I have centers of emission of life force. Now, the centers of emission of life force are related in a way to the shape. Like we said, the shape of the container connects to all the higher levels. And it connects that through the vortices. So in a human being, we have seven major vortices here that we call the chakras. One on the head here, here, and heart chakra, uh, stomach chakra, uh, procreation chakra, base chakra. And then we have some other chakras above and some other chakras below. Now, if I can measure the chakras, those vortices, on a statue, it means that the shape creates the connective vortices to all the higher dimensions. Now, a statue on a physical level is not alive, but through its shape, it contains all the other dimensions. So actually, a statue can be a container of all the higher dimensions and transmit them. I can take them from the statue, transmit them to me. So I can actually interact with the chakras of the statues. This means that chakras are basically uh, a result of a forming process. We have uh, a law that says subtle energy formed or shaped produces function. So when we look at natural shapes, like let's go a bit inside the body and see how an open energy system like the human being uh, interacts with subtle energy outside. Subtle energy, that means life energy, exists outside. Now life energy is drawn in. I draw it, let's say, through my breath. I draw in and out. When I draw in life energy, it goes into the lungs. Now, the lungs are shaped to produce the life energy in such a way that to sort of uh, give it a certain function. So the energy is formless. The subtle energy comes in with all the functions together. Now, every time they have to be rearranged in such a way optimal for the function they produced. And that happens through the shaping the shaping of the body. 
how the lungs shape the subtle energy to produce the energy needed on that level. Let's say the stomach will do it in a different way. The energy coming into the heart will do it in a different way. So the shape of every organ will give subtle energy the functions that are needed to be produced on the physical level. And at the same time, those shapes create the vortices needed for the multidimensionality of interacting with energy because you need, when you breathe energy, your lungs, the shape of your lungs should actually be fine-tuned to all the levels of subtle energy. Otherwise, it will lack. It should be fine-tuned to vitality, to emotions, to mental, to spiritual. So the design of the shape of the lung will act with all those levels to produce the needed function. So in a statue here, I can actually, uh, since there are functions related to the shape of the body, I can activate one or the other, make it stronger than the other. So let's say if I move the center of balance of the shape like that on the heart level, see, on the heart level like this, like this, I will accentuate this chakra. On a stomach level, accentuate this chakra. On this level, accentuate this chakra. So uh, here we understand that the chakras are shape-related, form-related. They are created on the physical level through the forming process on the physical level to connect so that the forming process creates chakras, energy wheels, that produce multidimensional vortices that connect with the higher levels and bring down life energy into the shape. So, it is all about making living energies. Now, we have a problem in our civilization. When we uh, develop modern science, we excluded the human being from all our experiments because we thought that the human being is too subjective, too opinionated and things like that. And subjectivity gives very complex variables uh, in any experiment. But it doesn't mean that they cannot be studied, those complex variables. We can go into them. But it makes things so complicated, having a subjective effect in creating a physical experiment, that we decided to keep the human being out of uh, our scientific experiments. So we developed uh, a scientific world, we developed modern technology with the human being out of it. So what should have been done? I mean, when I have a formula, any formula, whether I'm building a chip or building anything, uh, if I add the human variable to it, but that means I'm adding emotional, mental, spiritual concepts, I'm adding subjectivity, I'm adding all those things in the formula. Yes, we should have a, a sort of a, a dynamic variable in there that contains so many secondary variables in it that reflect the subtle energy of life, that reflects life force. So life force becomes a major variable in the formula of our scientific uh, experiments or in our scientific worldview. Then we would be building a civilization for human beings or for living, uh, or living beings. But what we are doing now is we have created a very advanced civilization that gives 
ultimate leisure and pleasure to humanity, while at the same time being at the cost of the human being. <coughs> so you see, there's something wrong in this formula. We are building a civilization that depletes life energy. That means our civilization is sucking out the life energy out of the living systems in nature. And that means reduced life energy means reduced immunity. That means as we go along, as civilization advances, immunity is reduced and we end up with so many types of pandemics that will actually sooner or later uh, end life on earth. Now, we should restore a sort of a design language that brings back life energy into things. We cannot build products that do not acknowledge life force, so they are dead products, and then we put them in the body of the earth where all the components are connected to life force are living components. What we have here now is sort of dead rubbish, sorry to call all the products of modern technology dead rubbish, but in a way from a life force point of view, they are like putting dead matter in the living body. And the more dead matter you keep putting in the living body, the more you reduce uh, its life force, the more you reduce its immunity until you bring its demise. Now, I don't think that the greater earth being will wait till humanity uh, can really create uh, a major disturbance in the earth. At some level, the earth will just hit back and uh, completely erase humanity uh, from its uh, life system and maybe a new living species will come and do something better. So we have to now design in order to bring life force into our, all our products. Now, I'm going to go a step further and ask myself, is this a new concept or is it only something that has to do with our modern civilization? Now, can I find examples where humanity respected life force and sort of uh, imitated the forming process of nature, imitated the animals? Can in we pause here, Mastura? Divine laws. Because now he will move to talk about history and how the ancient civilization respected the sacred and built the architecture in a way for the life force right so right. he will explain that but i i would love us to reflect on what he said he said a lot but he sure did yes i've been thinking of how uh, the commercializing of everything have made uh, the human being, like people are living in cubes, you know, basic right. cubes and in surrounded by all pollution and things like that, where uh, I look for example of how not very recent history, uh, uh, very ancient history of how natives uh, everywhere in the world Mm -hmm. would know how to design, like, for example, in Upper Egypt, 
uh, the natives themselves know how to build uh, their houses in a way that can make the wind flow. So they don't need in the hot weather, they have the middle of uh, the house mm -hmm. uh, will be very cool. And it is built by natural matter from their environment. So they will save uh, the coolness of the house in in summer and it will be warm in winter. So things like this, you, and you see it in not only in Egypt, everywhere. Right. And that has to do with the shape. So whether you look at, at the body or you look at the living quality, he talks about the quality, you see that shape has a function, as he said, right. which all has to do with what we call the underneath fabric of the universe, the, what we call the sacred geometry. Yes. And it comes very subtle. So the Sufis has always taught we have the physical world and the subtle world. And Al-Alam Al-Latif, Al-Alam al kathif So the subtle world now, scientists also talking about, you know, the quantum world <laughs> where everything is like in a fog, you know, united that way and has the archetypes there and from it, uh, everything physical. And this is very subtle and minute. Like very subtle means microscopic or uh, quantum, you know, like very mm -hmm. the microscopic way. So it all made sense to me when I listened to his uh, thoughts about it. What, what did you feel or how, what did you think? You know, I was thinking when he was giving that demonstration with the little statue of the body and talking about the form and how just that form would, having that form would create those vortices like the chakras. Yeah, and by moving the arms to shape, you know, that this would open the heart and this, the head. And, you know, and I was just really in awe of that and thinking of, wow. If you can do that with a suppose, you know, a seemingly inanimate object like that, just think of when you add the dimensions of the of intention, of life force, of consciousness, of you know, breath of spirit, of you know, the um, you know, our 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 faith, our trust, our invocation, supplication, and sound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the meaning that and purpose that we feel the divine inspiration, you know, the I was a hidden treasure that desired to be known and the that passion of that, you know, connectedness with that source and life force. And I was just thinking, what immense power, what immense um you know, just like when you add all of those dimensions together, if that can happen with a, a statue mm -hmm. and we contain so much more, it's rather mind blowing to think of the capacity of what we can tap into and what we can perhaps awaken to and harmonize with and uh, live in flow with. If we and that is probably yeah. awareness. And this is probably what you know people feel when they behold the sacred. Like in all forms of worship, you will find people making their hands up intuitively. Intuitively, mm -hmm. they will put their hands up, they will put their hands like that. Yes. And they will, you know, there is a movement like in Islam. The rotation the movement, the world is the, the dervishes. It creates the vortex. Yes. And and the whirling of the dervishes. So you look at any religion and you will find the motion combined by sound. So yes. the shape and the sound together uh, actually talk to our higher dimension. Yes. Uh, which yes. is the subtle dimension. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, with that, I was also thinking about like, you know, looking at this box that I'm in right here, 
um, there are trees outside. I can see the trees outside the window, but if I put some intentional shape into this space mm. that with the intention of bringing the life force of the trees into this space, like what a difference that might be able to make in just the life force, the replenishment of the life force I feel in my body mm -hmm. in just, you know, being, uh, living in this space, you know, and I, it, it's like, I, and I know that there are, um, you know, some practices that will bring different shapes and things into the living space mm -hmm. in order to, you know, have intention to connect with higher forms of consciousness, with nature, with, you know, intention, you know, bringing that in with intention like that, that can help. And I just, yes. I just felt the importance of what that could do to our, our bodily systems and our immune systems and our, um, our rejuvenation of our energy on an ongoing basis. Our emotions, yes. which is the connection between all of these levels. Because, you know, think about it. What really helps us is nature, to be in nature itself. Or if you are inside your house or office, to put certain items. And we know it. If you put flowers, if you put the sacred geometry art, if you do these simple things. And actually, it's maybe an opportunity to, to speak about the uh, Dr. Ibrahim Karim book called Biogeometry Signature. So he tells you simple tips to do in your house to min 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 minimize the effect of the electronics, which is affecting us a lot. And we use it a lot. Mm -hmm. So he tells you certain tips. And he also designed certain shapes that you can boot or you can draw to release some energy in the body about one of the organs or like he explained it. I just got the book, so I didn't read all of it, but yes. I got it introduced a little bit to the idea. And I've been drawn naturally, intuitively to do the sacred art, even without uh, fully rationalizing it. It is something I feel like that's how yes. the artist in us comes and to try to design harmonious things. Like when he talks about like how uh, it's a it's a universal language, the life force, it's a universal language, the language of design. You, music, for example, is universal. Like you feel the harmonious tunes can speak to anybody. If it's a good quality music, it will speak to anybody regardless of who they are, where they are from, what language they speak, it's universal. Similarly with art, you look at art, if it is, again, where it is coming from the person, it's coming from that life force, the sacred place, then you feel it in the art and you receive that energy. It's like you're connected. You're connected to that life force through these uh, sacred shapes. So it is uh, definitely creates the harmony you just feel it. It is not something we can fully rationalize, but I like the way he rationalizes it also. Yes. Yes, I do too. So I pinned you in case you wanted to show something from his book. I didn't know if you were holding something up there. Um, uh, and can you say the name of his book? This is the new one that just came out. So I yeah, have to give a plug called, for it. It is called Biogeometry Signatures. It's on Amazon. Harmonizing the body, subtle energy exchange with the environment. Okay, Dr. so that is one of his new biogeometrical books. signatures, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So it has uh, it has simple designs, really, that he says you can print it or you can try it. Try, I tried try, try. one uh, yesterday to see how it feels to release. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle. As he says, it's very minute, very subtle, but you could feel it when you are doing this drawing. You know, just like CD would tell us to write his books, to have that yes. connection between, I mean, you think about when you, you see something and it transmits a message through your eyes to your central nervous system, and then you feel it in your body. 
you draw it through your arm and out your hand and then you see it again it really brings a um i think very subtle awarenesses to the subconscious layers of your being when you do that and so i can imagine how that can connect you with the that laws of nature that govern and that he's that he's defining or or outlining I know he didn't create it, right? He is he is outlining it, his discoveries in, in the study of biogeometry. This is the laws of mm -hmm. nature. So I find it yes. fascinating. Yes, it is like when, when we write, because we have been studying and talking about the letters, and we did mm -hmm. these beautiful interviews about sound and letters. So uh, one form of the letter is the written one. And so the written one has its energy, and the word as a whole has its meaning, it's multi-dimension. It evokes emotion, you see it, so it involves the senses, it involved, it involved the subtle sound inside you as you read the word within you, and then it involves, as you said, the access of the emotions, the nervous system, then the brain, the rationality. So it's a, it is truly multi-dimensional. And yes. it's a vortex, an inward vortex, kind of. Yes. And that we have reaches the to the universe. dimensions. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have the harmonics that's created by the angles of the shapes. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it is just like, I really feel like this biogeometry brings so many things together that we have been talking about in our various interviews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it comes to the letters, I love Arabic language, so everybody sometimes are connected to their language deeply, which another human being might not be in a, in a way ready to receive from another language. What I like about sacred geometry as a meditation and as a way to connect to the holy is that it's, it's universal language. Everybody will connect to circles coming together or you know sacred shapes coming together uh, so that's what uh, dr ibrahim karim say also about his designs he says this is not uh, uh, something religious it doesn't belong to anything it doesn't have a symbol uh, it just it, it makes the energy flow it makes uh, it gives the uh, it is certainly gives something to the eyes that you feel it provokes something also, but he, um, it's a language that is, that could be universal, you know? Yes. Yeah. The laws of nature that are not dependent on a language or not, not uh, exclusive to a specific language or a specific region or a specific, you know, religion, but laws of nature are universal. So these letters, sound... letters themselves are universal. But it's our perception that maybe creates the biases and so forth. Because yes. letters are just, again, uh, sacred geometrical shapes, symbol shapes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are beautiful when you look about other languages too. There is something about them that is uh, profound. It, it, because through it, we, we actually build a generation through the ability to speak, to come with a symbol for the letters, to pass it from generation to generation and leave knowledge for someone to inherit that knowledge and build on it. So in a way, it's our perception. And uh, mm -hmm. it's okay. That is sometimes where the person is. Uh, it might be difficult for them to relate to another language. So they can also... Uh, access the holy through something uh, universal in a way absolutely fascinating fascinating study and I, I tell you what i would really like to know more about what he talked about this is something i want to go seek out and dive deeper into no pun intended but is the the water and life force that that is carried through water and the consciousness and how water you know from the beginning of creation that is you know it's it's something that and maybe you can speak to that as well because in the sufi teachings it's you know everything is an ocean right it's this is the ocean of living consciousness the ocean of sound 
the uh, first emanation from the God consciousness is our Rahman, which is the ocean of consciousness, the the womb of the existence, and and uh, you know it's water in Sufism is is the symbol of love, which is uh, what created everything. So water is a primordial, eternal water kind of, no, which manifests as the physical water but also exists hidden in dimension in all others because it's love that created the universe. So everything comes out of love. Even when you look at, uh, you know, like what we call gas, it, it actually has a vapor, like our air has mm -hmm. some vapor in it. So there is something uh, could be hidden and it is all created out of love. So when we about water we're talking about love that give life to everything so that is the archetypal water he's talking about yeah oh thank you for that it's beautiful, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. yeah he, even when the quran uh, speaks about the rain coming uh, and mm -hmm. uh, touching the earth the earth vibrates it says and now science can see that it is actually vibrating the soil starts to vibrate and then it brings its beautiful produce. It brings forms of life. So this uh, right. water is is the form of that love that uh, brings things into existence. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that is beautiful. And, you know, we know that we couldn't live without water. Our bodies are, you know, 75% water, 75-ish percent water. And without water, we can't sustain very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll continue now with part two from Dr. Ibrahim Karim. I'm going to go a step further. Ask myself, is this a new concept? Or is it only something that has to do with our modern civilization? Now, can I find examples where humanity respected life force and sort of uh, imitated the forming process of nature, imitated the animals, imitated all those divine laws and put them in their creations? So. Let us go back in history and see, uh, because many people think that I can create life or can create life force through artificial intelligence. Now, while artificial intelligence can create very advanced mental capabilities that will by far surpass our human minds, so that one day we'll have artificial intelligence running everything in our civilization. And it can even go so far as push us aside because our uh, very uh, comparatively weak mental capabilities will be a sort of uh, always uh, in the way of the, the perfection of artificial intelligence. So humanity will be taken out of all decisions uh, uh, that have to do with life. We'll just put humanity out. But those decisions that have to do with life are not really life decisions because the mental capabilities of artificial intelligence are only a simulation of life. But they do not contain life. So. What happens is, if you are not connected to life force, you are not connected to all the laws of nature. So you will have computers that do not have any ethical values because the laws of nature bring balance into our physical world through a translation from the right brain to the left brain and they emerge as ethical values. So computers 
will not have ethical values. If they decide uh, one day to get rid of humanity in order to have uh, a better functioning uh, technology, they'll do it. So artificial intelligence, the way we are following it, is not the way, and the question is why, because life energy cannot be produced with artificial intelligence. Life energy must be accessed. We look at it that way, that the background cradle of life since the beginning of creation is consciousness with all the universal laws that we call life energy. That is the background holistic subtle energy in which everything lives. So you don't look for life force. We're swimming in it. It's like if a fish is looking for water while it is swimming in the water. It's looking for water. It wants to invent water because it does not think uh, that everything is water. So we have this same problem. Life, we live in life energy. Life is out there. And we, life has to be accessed. Now the ancients somehow from the first uh, emergence or dawn of humanity on earth, they sort of uh, had a, an intuitive interaction with life because primitive humanity were actually based or their focus of perception was based on the right brain perception. That means the language of the heart, right brain perception, that is not the sensory uh, left brain perception. So actually they had a very weak ego, a very weak sensory perception, and they were con really focused in the inner life. So on that level, they were one with everything in nature. They did not see the oneness of nature. No, they were part of the oneness of nature. They did not look at life force. No, they were part of the life force. So they could acknowledge or understand the workings of life force from its core, from the inner uh, vision of that life force, from inside it. They don't have to go outside and watch it. They were part of it. So they, primitive humanity, identified the communicative vortices of life force out there in nature. They saw the tree communicating with multidimensionality through a sort of a vortex. Now, the tree had its roots and somehow connected to underground water and its leaves up there in the sky, and there was this multidimensionality in the tree. Now, they found exactly the same concept as in the tree. They found it in a sacred power spot, or what became sacred power spot to them. They found that there are spots on Earth that had the underground water crossings of underground streams uh, in the rocky strata of the Earth, and their crossings produced this vortex so you had the exact energy configuration of a natural object of a tree in certain locations on Earth. And they could be identified by when the crossings of underground streams uh, cross, they somehow produced this vortex and pushed streams on the surface. So now we have streams pushed on the surface, connected all the way up. That means full life force, water with full life force in those areas that became special power spots to them. They started bringing menhirs, large stones, putting them 
uh, in there, 40 ton granite megalithic stones that uh, actually had a high quartz content that resonated with this life force and could actually spread it uh, around. Uh, then they created those gate shapes, the dolmens, two megalithic shapes, and on it they put the a horizontal one that looks like a gate, and they directed it uh, to the east-west to connect it to the energy of life, to the life cycles. So now they, they understood life force and life cycles that is before any civilization, that's primitive cavemen. Later on, this developed into, uh, the, the Menhir developed into obelisks, where they brought the laws of uh, mathematics and geometry to the shape, and the dolmen, this gate shape, uh, became the, the archetypal shape of the Holy of Holies in uh, all religious buildings throughout history. So you had, for example, from the beginning, they had this uh, inner chamber and they put an earth mound on it, later on pyramids. Then they started building all those uh, architectural edifices with the Holy of Holies inside the temple. So it is from the beginning, humanity was actually putting the heart of its building, the Holy of Holies, its building, which brought in life force, but they put it in their design of the building and they located the building on a life force spot on earth so that they could have a sort of a human building. They built it in the same way that nature uh, sort of uh, forms a tree. So they formed their temple. They formed everything in such a way that the natural forces, the life forces, came into it. So they would call those temples the houses of the netters. Netters mean nature forces or uh, erroneously named gods. So they would say houses of the gods. So they br brought in all natural forces into their buildings. So they were designing actually all the products in the same uh, natural way along the same natural principles as nature was designing. So they were actually speaking the language of nature. When you acknowledge nature in your designs, you are speaking the language of nature. You're already communicating on a subconscious level with nature. So speaking the language of nature is a sort of uh, using the intellect of the heart to communicate with nature in a subconscious level. So you would be walking in nature and completely exchanging information with plants, with animals, with all things in nature because you were part of that nature. That is the natural forming process that has been practiced actually by humanity for many, many ages until a few hundred years ago. A few hundred years ago, uh, we completely uh, forgot about the placement of, uh, of our religious edifices or things like that, or the designing of our cities uh, according to those sacred power spots, we completely forgot those things. Why did you forget them? Because about a thousand, uh, thousand two hundred BC, as William James states it, uh, there was the complete shift of awareness into left brain consciousness. So the door closed to the subconscious. The door closed to the language of nature. So while humanity had an open door where it could speak to the language of, na the language of nature or with nature, now it closed the door. The subconscious was so excluded, it even became an enemy. And so the 
ego now, without the ethical values, without the laws of the subconscious controlling it, as when the center of perception was right there, when it was in the right brain, somehow it was controlled by all those uh, laws of nature. Now it comes out of the, it goes into the left brain and it is completely free of control of all the laws of nature. So now the sensory perception is master. It, it creates the sensory personality, the sensory ego, and it's an ego created by sensory information and a data bank created by sensory information must ultimately at the end serve the senses. And sometimes by serving the senses, because the human being on the left brain has also gotten a new th thing that it didn't have in the right brain or in the heart. It had now freedom of choice. This freedom of choice that had made it actually go further in sort of satisfying the senses beyond the sort of balancing laws of the right brain side of the heart that balanced the interaction with the senses. No, now we had full freedom and we could indulge in the pleasure of the senses, creating a sort of an imbalance in all our activities and productions. And this imbalance ends in so many in greed, in the way we look at things, and uh, a complete disrespect of the earth, of nature, and all that, so that at the end, uh, the, the left brain is uh, a mask that completely masks our real inner permanent self or immortal soul, and we are trapped in this mortal soul that makes us uh, see things completely detached from the laws of nature so automatically, life force, uh, we live in it, but we don't acknowledge it. And we, we live in the air, we don't acknowledge the air. How would that be if you don't acknowledge that there's air out there? But because you breathe it, because it's a, a level, you know it. But it's content, it's life force content, the content of the universe. Because life force exists everywhere in all the multidimensionality of the universe. So if you're looking uh, for, is there life in other planets? Is there life? This is a very stupid question to ask. Is there life somewhere else? Because all those planets are based in life force. It's the opposite. Everything is based in life force. So the question is, what forms of life are out there? Life need not be uh, a physical electromagnetic life based on electromagnetic particles as we have here. You could have life based on emotional particles, life based on mental particles that would be invisible to us but would be solid in their own dimensions. So now that we have seen how the ancients respected life force, now when they built their city, they had to make their city replenish the life force of all its inhabitants. So they placed all the main buildings on their power spots, on the sacred power spots. And in those main buildings, they, th this would be sort of everything important in their life w was placed there. Whether it was the hospital, it was the temple, it was the ruler's palace, or it was the marketplace, 
or things like that, they were all placed on power spots. And then they were connected through avenues so that the balancing life force would flow along the avenues so that when people walked from one place to another, they actually, through walking, they uh, uh, sort of help the movement of life force along those avenues. And then it came to the secondary roads that went into the homes and all that. They were done in such a way that the, those main avenues would sort of give life force to the secondary roads to go into every home in the community. Now, you had a city that replenishes the life force of all its inhabitants. We have a city that is alive, but positively alive. It's a very healthy being that's alive. And the cells in it will also be very healthy. The cells, meaning us, will be very healthy in it. Nature will thrive in it. That is in contrast to cities that grow with a depleting life force. So I just wanted to say how uh, it is related to what we talk about in our sound class about how people in, in, in the past, ancient times or not even so ancient sometimes, they were living with nature as part of it. They were not divorced from it. They didn't need to dissect things to find life. They intuitively interacted with life. So they will see uh, even the letters, as we know, came from the movement of the stars and the moon houses and the shapes of the letters came from that and how they knew when that letter appeared on another way, when that star appeared, when the moon in this and this house, that the weather will happen like that on Earth that we need to harvest or we need to plant this seed or we need to be careful the cold is coming and they also predicted how the mood of people will be based on the weather and the agriculture and all of that so for them they looked for the stars for directions so they were totally part of nature, as he said. They, they didn't have to go out of the way to dissect everything and look far away to find the life force. They were part in it and with it and intuitively because it uh, it is their life. Their life depends on it and their life, uh, they interact with it daily. So they make sure to design the cities in that healthy way where there is the, the water and then how the important places that gather people together, the holy places that bring the community together needed to be in the center and from it all the avenues that the communities build around it. So there was a sense of unity and the harmony. Yeah. Yes. They didn't need to Google it like we do, mm. um, you know, which is, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, on one hand, good that we have this ability to Google things, but on the other hand, you know, he said, he said two things that really stood out for me where he talked about, I think he said, excuse me, about 1200 years ago, where that um, door closed to the right, right brain and that connection with the um you know the subconscious with nature with the uh super conscious if you will and uh that we became left-brained dominant and he didn't speak as to what caused that closure um but i can't help but think that there's like a um uh, a snowball effect if you will of you know where we've really developed this this world that we live in that's based in all these radio waves and these frequencies that distort our uh, connection with the vibrations of nature 
you know, we're more connected with these man-made radio wave systems that have come out of our artificial world that it it takes us out of that, you know, it, it just causes that distortion. So it's harder for us to connect with nature. We've also built on top of nature and actually wiped out so much of the natural world from our the surface of our planet. And we live in these boxes, so it does make it harder for us to reconnect. You know, as as he has said, we're, you know, in the left brain dominant and not connected. And we're building sn this snowball effect there. But he also talked about that, um, you know, that that question about instead of asking, is there life out there? <laughs> what there forms out are there? there? Yeah. yeah what forms of life are out there because everything is based in life force alive yes everything, yes, is, everything alive is alive and, and has life force and based in life force so what other forms of life are there out there and we when we think about you know prior to this shutdown right of our our uh, right brain or our connection of our right brain like the you know when he talks about he talked about the um that i wrote i made a note about it you know that um that what's invisible to us but was is solid in their own dimensions yeah. and i can't help but think that with this this time where this was open and connected that there was awareness and access to other dimensions where things that may be invisible to to us now that were solid in their own dimensions were visible then when this was open and so when we think of, well, how did they move these giant quartz rocks onto yes. these power and spots, cut it right? to precise yes. and accuracy to do these and things where we look at it. now and yeah. say, that's impossible. How could anyone do this? But they had access to mm -hmm. awareness and to what is perhaps invisible to us now that mm. maybe wasn't invisible then. So here is what I think you ask an important question. What caused it to happen? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's uh, because we have the two hemisphere or the the pool uh, of the physical dense world. So whenever we reach a certain level of knowledge and there is like this uh, movement that becomes so mater materialistic, Mm -hmm. So we have this in recent history, uh, the philosophy of materialism is that everything is only physical and and that divorced all of the sciences from the spiritual and sometimes the ethical quality mm -hmm. form of it. And the human being was taken from uh, from the equation. The, the, the effect on the human being was taken away of the equation. So in a way, when we start to think like that, that is the 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 right brain <laughs> is more diminishing, and the mm -hmm. left brain is more like dominant, yes. and so there is out of balance because we need mm -hmm. to be balanced, and uh, then we design things and find discovery and keep dissecting and looking. Where is life force? But we are in life force. Right. <laughs> Where is God? We are in the ocean. Questions, but we are uh, living it. So mm -hmm. in a way, how can the fish look for the water? She's in the water. So that is yes. the... the like, and then when that happens, all the designs are not... It is based on material, maybe greed or arrogance and things like that that mm -hmm. shut off the effect on seeing or having the, the mm -hmm. consequences a vision of the config consequences of what we do so we mm -hmm. do a lot of factories don't uh, know all of a sudden we discover oh we polluted the water oh we polluted the earth oh we mm -hmm. wipe the jobs for the people who are living on fishing and symbol uh, a human being living with nature like that so we don't take that into account and i think it's also psychic because where is this all civilizations he, he talks about we know that they cut all of these big rocks 
and the granny to a specific perception that they must have laser or some type of knowledge. How did they do it? Nobody knows. From modern science, they can't even imitate it. So right. that's amazing. So it means it's cyclic. cyclic. These are the cyclic. Like cycles? Like you see, you cycles, goes in cycles. Because yes. you see in the stories of the prophets, in all the holy books, in the Quran, that the, the, the someone will come to remind people Yes. You know, God or the life force brings someone who's awake and aware and send the messages to people. And the people, if they uh, they don't listen, mm. then there is consequences because the earth can't endure anymore. So mm -hmm. the earth kind of try to recycle it and all of all of that. So this civilization and the knowledge they had almost wiped it out. Uh, some people say maybe that was Prophet Nuh, the flood that flooded the whole earth. That was one cycle, you know. Right. And then a new cycle started and then uh, the message is held on for a while and then it gets forgotten again. So it's a tendency of every human being so it's for all of us to ask ourselves these questions and bring ourselves to awareness. Am I living, you know, uh, respecting nature and aware of this or, or not, you know? Yes. And am I, am I connecting with the higher levels of consciousness or at least, you know, in Sufism, right? The meaning of Sufism is purification of the heart. That's one of the meanings. And that's like, Am I doing my inner work to connect with spirit and connect with the higher levels of consciousness so I can increase my awareness of what exists beyond this, that thick bar of this material physical realm so that I can, can live more in harmony with nature and with spirit and like be aware of what exists, what may be solid in dimensions beyond Mm -hmm. this dimension that we live in which yeah. all has to do with connecting to really uh, the depth of our true humanity and connecting to what is holy being compassionate is holy being just is holy and returning to this root simple roots that we all have in our hearts uh, in a way also you can find all the messengers of, of god they come to awaken that in us again and to teach us some maybe rituals that uh, uh, bring that sense of sacredness and community and unity in us and make us aware of the subtle levels. So you find like, for example, when he was talking about the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain, I see like how Prophet Isa, والسلام, Jesus, he said, be one foot on earth, one foot in heaven. So bring that balance. Prophet yes. Muhammad, uh, you know, may peace be upon him, he would do everything starting by his right hand or right foot, his conscious. But then he accompanied that with a prayer. So wherever he sees the first harvest, he says a prayer. If he looks at the mirror, he says a prayer. We mount over the camel, he says a prayer. If he's going to the market, out of the market, in the house, out of the house, when the rain comes, when we hear the thunder. So everything was accompanied by a prayer and, and prayer because language and sound is the uh, is, uh, language of the soul. You know, the soul uh, speaks, the body speaks about the physical, you know, it tells you when it has pain or it has a disease. But the language of expression, it's unique to the human being and it's what uh, can refine uh, our level of awareness yes. of what is holy at the moment. Yes. Uh, and that, that when you say that, what's, I guess, when I'm feeling what's coming to me, when you say that about accompanying everything with a prayer, everything that you see mm -hmm. and that you encounter in every movement and every transition from inside to outside and from outside to inside and to, you know, over and under and everything 
accompanying everything with a prayer is really acknowledging the um, the true life force, which is that love that you spoke of. And then really, you know, it's like, what an opportunity if we could all um, like sincerely train ourselves, if you will, or, or, you know, habituate ourselves to, to have that invocation and that recognition of that life force of that pure love of that exists within everything, in everything that we, we do and see and you know in, in come into contact with what i i can only imagine what an impact that would have on the heart and soul it is like they treated everything as alive also like prophet yes. muhammad would say i love this mountain or we love this mountain and the mountain loves us so he could see the mere existence of the mountain and what it can uh, how much he can take from the mountain, you know, uh, all beautiful things. So he can see the love, the love of the life force that is in the mountain and he loves it back or whether it's the trees. So you find like uh, the stories about all the holy books communicating with everything or considering everything and treating everything with that kind of reverence and love and the respect so that is uh, maybe something we lost you know yes yes and what a you know that's something that would not be so hard to bring back mm. just really setting an intention and saying you know i'm going to do this and do it and it might take a while to develop the habit but the power of that habit in to really transform our hearts and and help us to um connect with the sacred and bow our hearts in reverence to everything to the life force within everything that we see and the aliveness uh, of everything that we see and and connect to the sacred through it what what an opportunity it's Thanks. you know uh, something i have to say that uh, i watch it in yunus emery a journey of love which are a serious Turkish series about that Sufi poet. So it tells you about his life, his relationship with his sheikh. And you can see that his spiritual teacher of how they were all in the habit when someone hands the other something. It's like an inanimate object. They kiss it first, say, Alhamdulillah. And the, so they are interacting with everything, whether it's uh, they are coming back from a trip, they actually kiss the house wall and say, Alhamdulillah, praise to God or thanks God. So everything they interacted with one another and with the inanimate objects, they always treated it as a holy moment, mm -hmm. a holy interaction, a holy life so they were always bringing that sense and you feel it when you watch it you you feel that so it's very beautiful concept if we again set our intention as you said and try to remember it's uh yes. it's a path of remembrance yes. what we and call in sufism a zikr yes <laughs> remember it. To, to develop the habit and that's something that we can each do and you know a change we can make in our lives that's absolutely free and can have an a, a really powerful effect on ourselves our homes our families communities and our world so there's an opportunity right there <laughs> i mean thank you thank you for being with us for part one and two of this a presentation with Dr. Ibrahim Karim. Stay tuned in the Ocean of Sound Summit as we've got more coming to you. This is our, our uh, final interview of this series. However, we've got some opportunities coming uh, for you to join Amani and me live for 
reflections and ahas and and discussions and we'll have a q a session coming up as well so stay tuned for all of this we want to hear from you we want to interact with you we want to share with you this has been an absolutely fascinating time so do make sure that you consume everything that we've offered in this summit and we will see you live very soon